we need to communicate to people when you when you do x it hurts me please don't do x again and in a lot of cases that can salvage the relationship because then the friend knows oh i didn't mean to hurt you Hi ladies, welcome back to another episode of our Smart Women, Smart Moves video series, where we sit down with a variety of experts to share all their tips and tricks to help you level up in your life. If we haven't met before, my name is Tia Angelos and I am the founder of Smart Women Society. We're here to help you get smarter with your money, career, well-being, and love life in a really actionable and easy to understand way. We are so lucky to be joined today by Dr. Hannah Coral, who is both a clinical neuropsychologist and registered psychologist who has completed over a decade of study into the psychology of relationships and the conditions of the brain. If this isn't amazing enough, Hannah is also a published author with her book, How to Break Up with Friends. As you can probably see from the title of this video, we are going to be chatting about all things toxic friends. Before we get started, don't forget to give this video a thumbs up and to subscribe to our channel. Let's get into it. Hannah, thank you so much for joining us today. Thanks for having me, Tia. It's so nice to be part of a bunch of really incredible smart women. Amazing. We're so happy to have you here. Navigating friendships and especially toxic friendships is one of the most popular topics amongst our community. So I am so excited to have you here to share your knowledge and all your insights. But before we get into it, can you tell us a little bit more about yourself? Um, so my name is Hannah. I'm a neuropsychologist and a neuroscientist. I work in Sydney. Um, I work at a hospital out here and I have a practice that I run in Cremorne. Um, and neuropsychology just means that I sort of encompass that space between what is your brain doing and why does our brain make us do the weird and wonderful things that we sometimes do like fight and flight mode and repetitive patterns and repetitive circuits in our brain that just make us do things to you where we go why did I do that again um and also the heart space so your psychology so what's going on with um your life and the people that you've encountered and the patterns that you've developed as a consequence of being around those people again and again and again so it's that sort of intersection between well what's your brain doing and what's your heart space doing and how do those two overlap to explain what's going on for you Incredible. I'm so excited to get into this topic. So let's start off with defining it. What actually is a toxic friend or friendship? <laughs> That's a really, really good question. Um, and it's, it's something that, you know, you could literally write a book on the topic, which is what I've done. Um, so in my book, How to Break Up with Friends, we really delve into well, what is your toxic friend? So we've all had that one friend who we're stepping on eggshells around, who's making us feel crappy, who's making us feel like, we feel worse after we leave the interaction with them than before we even started it. So, you know, it's it's really easy for us to kind of uh, point out abusive relationships or bullying relationships where somebody's overtly screaming at you or swearing at you or um, stealing your money. All of those things are very overt. But I think what kind of often traps us and trips us up is when the behavior is more covert. It's more covert types of passive aggressive speaking, um, belittling, putting a person down, making them feel like they are worthless or their opinion is worthless. And that you, you essentially have less respect than the individual who's talking to you. So your opinion is less regarded, your intelligence is less regarded, your life choices are less regarded. And in some way that person feels like they're better than you. And that that's a really insidious issue that kind of seeps out into every domain of your relationship with that person when they feel like they don't ultimately respect you as an individual. So you and I would be here all day Tia if we if we listed all of the things that make a person toxic we could we could be on this this Skype call forever um, so I think the really important thing to remember is essentially what's going on with your feeling so how do you feel do you walk into the interaction feeling worse than before you entered it do you feel anxious and um, insulted and offended during the interaction do you feel apprehensive in the lead up to that interaction with that friend all of those are pretty good signposts that something's not going right with your friendship and maybe that friendship might be toxic 
Awesome. And I want to delve into that topic a little bit more. What are some of the biggest warning signs of a toxic friend? I know you said it's a lot about feeling, but are there some really big red flags in friendships that really show that it's quite toxic? So I think I think one of the best warning signs that something is not going right with a friendship is something that people find really controversial, which is the idea that a friendship is supposed to be reciprocal. And that basically means that you are supposed to expect something from your friend, okay? And I'm not asking that they give you a yacht and matching boat shoes and they buy you a house. I'm not saying that the friend owes you the world. What I'm saying is they owe you a a basic level of reciprocity in the friendship, which means if you're giving trust, support, affection, and respect, that you should expect that that friend is also giving you trust, support, affection, and respect. So this reciprocity, this give take, the back forth, if that's missing in a friendship and that's happened for a protracted period of time, that's a pretty clear warning sign that the friendship is out of whack that somebody's giving more and somebody's taking more than they should be. And that's a pretty uh, fixed path towards you feeling taken for granted um, and used. So it's beautiful and it's altruistic to enter a friendship feeling like, I don't expect anything in return from this friendship. I give and give and give and don't expect anything back. And women particularly, we're really good at doing that. We're really good at doing that with our partners and our kids and our workspaces and with our friends. But what I, what I fundamentally feel like women need to learn is that we are allowed to expect something back in return. And that is basic decency, basic kindness, basic respect. And from a friend, it should be a little bit more than basic because that's what elevates someone from just being your basic, your basic to somebody who's actually your friend. Does that make sense? Yeah, absolutely. And I think that kind of concept of imbalance with the friendship is a really big indicator because as you said, a friendship is that one step up from just being an acquaintance and you should be getting some sort of reciprocal um, outcome from that. Um, So now moving on to the effects, how can a toxic friendship impact you? Okay, so this is the best part of the book, I think. Uh, I love this part of the book, which is all about talking about what is the neurological impact? What is the biological impact? What is the physiological impact of being chronically exposed to somebody who is toxic to you over time? And the scary thing, Tia, is the research is pretty clear about this. Uh, It's pretty consistent in showing that exposure to a friend, not a family member, not a work colleague, I'm talking about friends specifically, Over time, if you are chronically exposed to a strained relationship, the longitudinal research shows us that that is on par with the health effects of chronically smoking and obesity over time. And it actually is on par with chronic illness and can shorten your lifespan. Now, the reasons for that is probably because of something called our vagus nerve in the back of our heads. Now, this is a type of nerve that you've probably heard of fight and flight before. Most people have. Yeah. So some people don't realize, well, that's actually that's actually a a colloquial term for something called the sympathetic nervous system or the not so sympathetic nervous system, as I like to call it, because it actually floods your body with a bunch of stress hormones, cortisol, adrenaline. It tightens your muscles. It suppresses your digestive system. So I'm talking about the ladies who have food intolerances, food allergies, tummy aches. Um, It suppresses your sleep. It gives you terrible headaches and it just has this uh, over time cumulative effect on your body that affects down to your cellular level. So the the replication of your cells over time changes and you get into something called chronic adrenaline mode and fight and flight mode all the time where you're waking up in the morning and your heart's racing or you're about to go and see that friend and you're feeling stressed out or you see a text message from them and you feel stressed out, or you know that they're expecting something from you and you feel stressed out. And and that continual pumping of your heart, elevation of your heart rate, continual exposure to stress builds up over time in your system. And you bear the cost of that. You bear the cost of that over time. And research tells us that that cost equals shortening your lifespan, increasing your risk of cardiovascular issues, increasing your risk of things like dementia and overall making you just feel bloody sad and not happy. And that's 
that's not a way to live, is it, Tia? No, not at all. And it's crazy how profound the effects can be just from these friendships that we can expose ourselves to. So if we do find ourselves in this situation with a friend, what can we do? What are our options? Yeah, so look, there's so many ways you can handle these things. And I love when I say the the answer that I always give, everyone always rolls their eyeballs when I say this, Tia, but it really does start with communication. Okay, so (laughs) it's not a case of you're out to drinks and Sandra has just insulted your outfit uh, and that's the 17th time she's insulted you while you're out and you're five cocktails down and that's when you decide, that's it, I'm breaking up with her as a friend. Breaking up with friends is not something that we do in the heat of the moment and that's really, really important for us to recognise because I think words like integrity are really important. You, have, you are a woman of integrity. If you're listening to this right now, if you've taken the time to enroll in a smart woman society course, you are a woman of integrity, okay? And all the women listening to this know what that means deep down in their heart. Like, yes, I have integrity in the things that I do and the things that I say. So whatever I do, I know that I'm going to walk down the street one day. And if I bump into that person again, if they happen to be on the interview panel of my next job, if they happen to be somebody that I encounter in a communal situation with old school friends again, whatever I've said, I have done with class and integrity so that I know I can hold my head up high if I encounter them again. Now, this all goes back to communication and women, especially, we kind of grow up in societies where we're told that a good woman is a quiet woman, a woman who doesn't rock the boat, a woman who isn't a buzzkill. God forbid, don't ever be a buzzkill, Tia. Oh, never be a buzzkill because that's the worst kind of woman. Don't be a nag. That's the worst kind of woman. And that, that kind of social norm has trained women to feel like I can't ever say when something was wrong, when something was inappropriate because that makes me a nag. That makes me a complainer. That makes me a Karen. Like you don't hear people saying, oh, you're a Brad term that gets hashtagged all over the world and goes viral. Like unfair, right? Super unfair. And essentially what that's trained women to think is that we can't say when something's wrong. So, you know, part of why I developed, I also developed an app called Assert Yourself, which is about helping men and women to feel that they can say, just say, you know, when you called me an idiot, when you spoke to me that way, when you canceled on la- canceled on me last minute, that really hurt my feelings. Please don't do that to me again. Simple as that. When you did X, it hurt me. Please don't do X again. And then if that person does do X again, saying again, I've asked you not to do that and you've just done it again. So I'm going to go now. So part of it is communication. And the other part of it is sticking to your boundaries. So we have to communicate that there's a boundary. I like to say, if your friend doesn't know that the shit exists, it's really hard for them to avoid putting their foot in that shit, right? They can't, they can't avoid stepping in the poop if they don't know it's there. So we need to communicate to people, when you, when you do X, it hurts me. Please don't do X again. And in a lot of cases, that can salvage the relationship because then the friend knows oh, I didn't mean to hurt you. I don't think people wake up in the morning going, ah, 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 who am I going to hurt today? People don't, people don't tend to do that. They, they make honest mistakes. I make mistakes. You make mistakes. We all make mistakes. And if someone can communicate, when you did that, it really hurt me. And then if they continue to do that thing that they know has hurt you, that's when you know, okay, this is at this time, this is toxic for my mental health and I need to do something about this. Um, so, and, and being able to say that without, without feeling like you're throwing a grenade that then detonates a confrontation bomb that makes life awful for everybody. That's a, that's about a, a barrier that all women need to s- surrender to. You're not detonating a confrontation bomb. If you tell these people when you did X, it hurt me, please don't do that again. And we do it in a calm voice. We do it with integrity. You can do it over text message if you need to. That's okay. Uh, Moving into if they keep doing that repeat toxic behavior, there are whole scripts in the book of how you can actually end a friendship. That is when, when it's no longer serving your mental health, how you can say with dignity and respect, I need to put my mental health first now and I can no longer give this friendship the time and the energy that it deserves. 
And some people prefer to do that in person. Some people prefer to do it over a text message where they have control of what's said and the person has the privacy to read that and to, and form a dignified response themselves. And some people might do that in, an, in another way, which is to readjust the time, the energy and the money that they are putting into that friendship. So maybe it's not a formal breakup, but it's a reevaluation of how much time, energy and money that you're continuing to pour into this friendship, which is not serving you. Awesome. There was so much to unpack there, but it's so interesting knowing that to firstly communicate and then when it's a prolonged kind of experience, then looking at your options, whether to break up or cut them off as a friend. I want to touch on the boundaries um, topic that you spoke on before. What are some examples of boundaries that you can set with friends and how can you enforce these? Yeah, that uh, that's a really, really great question. I love that question. It's, it's a tricky one because it's not traditional to typically like sit down with a friend over brunch and be like, okay, we're going to set some boundaries now. Like we don't usually preemptively set those boundaries. We kind of just do them as the issue arises. So I guess it's something you need to know within your own heart. You know, how am I, am I okay with friends swearing around me? That might be okay. But when, when friends swear at me, and they call, they direct them to those swear words to me and they call me names. I'm not okay with that. Or I'm okay with lending X amount of money and not expecting that to be returned because they're in financial hardship. But I'm not okay with paying for every meal, um, footing the bill and, and footing every expense or not getting paid back large sums of money. Um, it might be that I'm okay with them not replying to my messages or speaking to me because I know they've just had a baby and they need some time. Or, or I'm I'm I need to have some form of communication with this friend over a span of a year. I can't just not hear from them and then suddenly get the invitation to fly overseas for their wedding. Um, so it kind of comes down to you personally and what you're going through with your friendship. I think when it comes to acceptable excuses, you know, we, and everybody does, we all, the ebbs and flows of life mean that you're going to have times where you can't give as much to that friendship, just like they can't give as much time to that friendship. So in terms of you yourself, it's really important for you to have that alarm bell inside your body. And I, that alarm bell means your gut instinct your intuition, your heart. You know, when you, you know when you go home after an interaction with a friend and you're in the shower and you're washing your hair and you're like, oh, why did they say this? Why did they say that? Or you're lying in bed and you feel crummy in your heart or you've made a commitment to do something like pick them up from the airport for the 17th time in, the, in a row and they've never once reciprocated and you're feeling in your heart regretful and sad and you're, you've got that, that icky feeling in your heart, which is saying, something doesn't feel right about this. I actually am not actually okay with what's happened. That is your gut instinct or your intuition trying to tell you that a boundary for you has been crossed where you don't feel like something is fair. And it only goes off when, you, when your heart, your intuition, your gut instinct knows that something's not quite right for you in the long term. Something's not right for you in the long term. So I think it's it's less about being able to go okay here's my here's my punitive exacting you know pragmatic rules on exactly how I want to be treated and I want you to sign this at the bottom of the you know of the contract and promise that you'll never do that because that's just not realistic in in today's or ever really in a friendship it's just not realistic but when something does happen and you are constantly walking away with this kind of niggling feeling in your heart this regret feeling in your heart your your alarm bell your intuition is going something is not right for me something is not right here for me well that's telling you okay there was a boundary and I need to listen I need to listen to that part of myself not push it down not ignore it which we're so good at doing we're so good at ignoring it. When your fight and flight constantly goes off, we start ignoring those intuitions deep down inside us. Um, we start not listening to them because that's how we survived. That's how we survived when we were younger. That's how we survived getting through a toxic relationship because the only way we could have survived was to ignore those feelings um, and not speak up. What I'm asking women to do is to sit in that Sit in that discomfort, sit in that space, journal to yourself, talk to yourself, find out 
why did you feel that way? What was it about that that upset you? What was it? Because often it's just the tip of the iceberg. That one little thing they did represents a huge uh, thing under the surface that hasn't been spoken about. It wasn't that they called me an idiot that one time. It was that for the last 15 years of our relationship, they've undermined me as a friend and they've always treated me as sillier than them or stupider than them or not as good as, as them in some way. Uh, and so it's actually not about that one little thing that happened. It's about this other whole insidious hidden under the under the water, the iceberg under the water that it's tapping into. And that's what's making me my heart niggle when something goes wrong. And that's when I need to say, when you called me an idiot, it made me feel sad. Please don't call me an idiot again. So I'm sure I'm sorry. It's not a clear cut answer and not a clear list of rules, but I suppose the golden rule is your body has an alarm system. Sadness, stress, anxiety, they're not there because they hate you. They're not there because they're trying to make your life hard. They're there because they really, really love you. Um, they're in your body because they care about you. And not for one second of one minute of one day will they stop warning you not to settle for less than what you deserve. And that's why you feel anxious, sad, stressed out and they're desperately desperately asking you to talk to them and find out why you feel that way so that you can do something about it wow that's incredible and always trust your gut i think is the biggest thing to take out of that because there will be so many warning signs coming at you and you have to not ignore them to actually realize what's going on awesome so as always we asked our community if they had any questions or any situations that you they wanted your advice on and i have four here that i want to get your insights on I just wanted to pop in here before we get into the community Q&A to show you two of the amazing products that were kindly sent to us by Logitech to help bring these videos to life. The first one is this stream cam webcam, which is absolutely awesome because it not only allows you to film in landscape mode, but also in portrait, which is great if you're doing any Facebook or Instagram lives. And then also this blue Yeti Nano microphone, which not only is an amazing blue color, but it also makes all your audio super crisp and clear. So if you're thinking of creating any video content, or maybe you just want to up level any of your Zoom or Teams meetings, definitely check out these two products. Let's get back into the Q&A. So the first one is one of my oldest and best friends is showing a lot of the warning signs of a toxic friend. We have grown up together and have shared so many memories, but I feel like we're going in two different directions and I don't like the way she is treating me. The problem is I can't just cut her off as this would tear apart our whole friendship group and my other friends still like her. What can I do? Ah, uh, that is the best question ever. And I'm so sorry to hear that that's happening to you, um, to the writer who sent that in. Thanks for having the bravery to send that in to us. Um, I think it's always important for me to point out that uh, longevity does not equal quality. So just because you've had a friend for a really long time, that doesn't give them a hall pass to treat you like crap. And I think something that we often get confused with is when you've known someone for a really long time, like, you know, with family members, we kind of, we can be a little rude to our family members, can't we? We can be a little snippy with our siblings and we, we might speak to our family in a way we would never speak to someone in public. And it's sort of true for friends that we've had for a really long time. They kind of take those liberties with us because they've known us forever and they know we're joking and we kind of slip up with the snippiness and maybe being a little bit less cordial and polite than we should be um, because we've known them for a really long time. And people sometimes do need a little slap on the wrist that, hey, you know, I'm not your doormat just because you've known me for a really long time. You can't undermine me in this fashion I'm not 15 anymore and and I need you to respect me like the adult woman that I am um, and this is probably a good example of you know I talked before about adjusting your effort levels with a friend because sometimes you do have communal relationships that you need to preserve because there's a wider friendship group and you're going to keep seeing that person again and again and again and again in that friendship group. So for this person, I would suggest, you know, it's it's about kind of calling out obvious behaviours when they happen. So if this friend undermines your opinion when you're in a group or calls you a name or doesn't respond to your messages, that's the opportunity that you need to say, when you do X, it makes me upset. 
please don't do X again. So giving that friend an opportunity to see the behavior and correct the behavior. Uh, and that doesn't mean you have to like air your dirty, dirty laundry with that friend and go into the entire history of your friendship and say, you know, for X many years, you've treated me badly. It just means that the next time she does anything that hurts you, or that's rude to you, that's passive aggressive to you, that's when you would call it out and say, you know, the way this conversation is going is making me feel really uncomfortable. The way you're speaking to me, the tone of your voice, the, the comments you're giving me, the way you're treating my opinion is making me feel uncomfortable and I need you to stop. And please don't speak to me that way. I'm trying to help you. And if they speak to you again that way, it's, it's about saying, I've asked you not to do that and you've just done it again. So I'm gonna excuse myself from this because I'm feeling uncomfortable and then leave that situation. And then, you know, that opens the doorway for you to have more conversations where they can say, I'm really sorry, I didn't mean to speak to you that way. And you can say, yeah, thank you, I appreciate that. And then if they keep doing it, well, that's when I would say in those situations, maybe the best solution for you, and we talk, that, talk about this in the book, is, is readjusting those effort levels. So how much time and energy and money are you giving to this friendship? Should you be going across town to see her for her birthday? Should you be spending hours on the phone chatting to her about her boyfriend troubles? Should you be putting that same level of effort into the friendship when it's very clear that her level of effort is insidiously rotting your friendship right down into the bottom of the ocean? So, you know, I, I think in that case, readjusting those effort levels is probably a good place to start, but also don't be afraid to communicate when she does the thing that really upsets you. The next question is kind of flows on from that, but how do you set boundaries with a friend who's not likely to react well to them? <laughs> oh my God. Yeah, this is the one that I think um, makes it difficult for us to set the boundaries when you have that friend who you know is gonna react explosively to whatever you say. Uh, and I'm a big fan of texting. I'm actually a huge fan of that. Like I know people say, oh my God, you can't possibly text somebody, that's the worst. I disagree. I think, you know, we're, we're in a different time now. It's, it's 2021. Back in the days when Seinfeld and Sex in the City used to make jokes about sending messages over, important messages over text and how inappropriate that was. It's a different time. It's a different stage nowadays. A lot of important things are sent over text messaging. It's our modern day equivalent to, to letter writing. Um, so I think being, having the space and the distance from a friend who you know is a little bit explosive is best for you. So that means writing up a carefully worded message, and, and we do have a lot of templates in the book of how you can word it, where it's respectful and where you're having integrity. And you're saying things like, you know, I'm sorry I put this in a text message. I just, my mental health was not in a place where I could have this conversation face to face with you. And that's okay. You're allowed to own that. You're allowed to own, I didn't feel confident to have this conversation with you in person. And you're allowed to have an interaction with a friend where you feel like, you know, I probably should have did what Hannah said and I should have called them out when they called me an idiot. And I didn't do it in the moment. So now I can't do it. That's not true. You can call somebody out on their inappropriate behavior after the fact. You are allowed to call people out on inappropriate behavior after it's happened because you've had time to think about it, to digest it, to sit at home and to write a carefully worded message to that person, which explains when you told me to shut up, when you interrupted me repeatedly, when you laughed at my opinion with the other guys at the table, it really hurt my feelings. Can you please not do that to me again? You're allowed to do that. And if you put it in a text message, what that does is it gives you time to sit and breathe through the message, make sure that it's a clear cut message, behavior, how it made you feel and what you're asking them to do. When you call me an idiot, it upset me. Please don't do it again. Nice and simple. No added layers to that. Nice and simple. And it also gives them the privacy to read through that message, reflect on that message, and maybe they might surprise you right back a message that's actually mature and dignified and shows a bit of insight. And if they don't react with maturity and insight and emotional intelligence, 
you aren't around them. You don't have to reply to those messages. You don't have to say anything back to those messages. You don't have to take a call. You don't have to respond. You can wait a couple of days for both people to calm down and to and for that person to calm down and speak to you when they are able to speak to you with the same level of integrity and respect. So, you know, don't be afraid to communicate with people who you know are volatile in a way that you feel comfortable with. You are allowed to communicate with people in a way that you feel comfortable with. There's nothing wrong with that. This next one is quite interesting and was quite popular. And it says, what about if I'm the toxic friend? What do I do? I say in the book, you know, there's a lot of mentalities of why we might stay with a toxic friend or why we might be thinking about toxic friendship. And of course we have these moments where we're gonna go, is it me? Is there something that I'm doing? And I think having that level of awareness where you're reading a self-help book or where you're questioning, what have I contributed to this situation? That's a pretty good sign that maybe you're not an asshole. <laughs> I mean, I can't, I wish I could look through the screen and assure you, you're definitely not an asshole. But you know, people who take the time to do self-improvement and self-awareness and introspection, that's when we look into ourselves and we see what we have contributed to a situation. Those people have a higher level of intellectual intelligence and those people are working on what parts did they contribute to this friendship? And maybe it was, yeah, I said some things I shouldn't have said when I was a bit drunk and it was late at night and I regret doing that. Um, or like in the book, we have a whole chapter, a whole chapter on jealousy uh, and a questionnaire on, are you jealous? Are you the one who's maybe giving a bit of jealousy to the friendship? And, and maybe that's insidiously eating away at the friendship. Um, and so doing those exercises that actually help you to see, well, what, what am I contributing to this situation? Um, and I suppose all I can say is, you know, one of the best, best lessons that I've learned, and I talk about this in the book, is, is a genuine apology, a genuine apology. Uh, how many times in your life, Tia, have you found that somebody's done something wrong to you and you've communicated it with them or you, you've just deeply, deeply, deeply wished that that person would please, please, please just realize what they've done and say, I'm so sorry. I, I honestly didn't mean to hurt you. I know that I've done that. And you know what? I'm, I'm going to work really hard to make sure I don't do that to you again. I'm so sorry that I did that. Offering a genuine and sincere apology for past behavior is almost this magical silver bullet that diffuses a lot of situations. When someone truly offers not a fake apology, a genuine apology. I am so sorry if I have hurt you in the past. It wasn't my intention. I, I, I think I was fueled from this insecurity or that insecurity. And we talk about those insecurities in the book. Um, and that's why I behaved the way that I did. And, you know, I'm, I'm working on it and I'm, I'm going to promise you that I'm going to try really hard not to do that again. And if I do, please do call me out on it. Uh, so I think that's a beautiful, beautiful learning tool. Nobody's perfect. Nobody's perfect. And I think any person among us who feels like they haven't at some point or another done something kind of crappy by accident or because they were busy or just they didn't have the time or they were emotionally drained and it led to them doing something they regretted, you know, we're few and far between those of us who are completely faultless, right? So it, it's an amazing, amazing gift that separates people from the, I suppose, the ignorant people who will not reflect on their behavior and will not change versus the people who do reflect on their behavior, take some ownership of their behavior, offer a sincere apology for their behavior, and then move forward as a different person who has grown. And the fact that you're even realizing that means that you are in this uh, liminal sage, we call it, of change and growth and moving forward and being a better person. And that's a great thing. That's a great place to be. And now onto our last question. How do I move on from a friendship breakup and open myself up to new friendships? I'm hesitant to put myself out there because I feel like my judgment is lacking and I don't want to experience the same thing again. Yeah, I, I, another great question. Um, yeah, look, Friendship is a funny thing. I, I've done a lot of research and we talk about this in the book. In Australia, every second person you meet, one in two people, every second person you meet feels lonely, right? 
75% of us are saying that we don't have a friend that we feel like we can talk to at least once a month, at least once a month. So there are so many people out there, so many people. And on, on the Instagram, um, at no bullsite, bullsite, we, I get so many messages from people saying, oh my God, I have experienced this. So many messages. So let me tell you, you are not alone. You are not alone in the way that you feel. And the research is pretty clear. You know, your brain is only wired to have like five super, super, super dope, duper close friendships anyway. So it's not like you need to have oodles and oodles and oodles of friends. Don't be fooled by social media these days, which is telling us, you know, look how popular I am. I have a hundred friends at my, at my simple birthday and we're all in matching t-shirts and standing in front of a balloon garland and look how popular I am. That's, that's a, that's not real. It's not real life. It's not, it's not normal. And it's not something you have to do to have oodles of good friends. In fact, the literature tells us you can get the positive effects of a good friend with just one friendship with just one, so long as it's a good quality friendship. So one, number one, take the pressure off yourself to feel like you have to have oodles of friends. Number two, recognize that there are so many people out there who are in the same boat as you and who also want to make new friends. And number three is putting yourself out there to actually make those new friends and trusting that you've learned from those past relationships and that you will approach new friendships differently if that person does something that's not right, you're going to say something about it this time. And you're going to start the friendship off with any inappropriate behavior gets called out. You trust yourself that you're going to do that, but actually go out and do that. There are so many people say, oh, I can't make new friends as an adult. And it's not true. You can make new friends as an adult. And I, I think the question I always put back on people is, well, what have you tried? What have you actually tried in terms of making new friends? Like, have you gone to any meetup groups to make new friends? Have you gone on Bumble Friends? Have you joined any social groups? Have you put that time, energy and money and reinvested it into something you enjoy? Like for me, I went, you know what? I think I want to salsa. I think I want to learn to salsa. So I went to Go Dance here in Sydney and I, I learned to salsa and I met this huge community of people who I see regularly like once or twice a week and because we see each other and we have mutual interests surprise surprise I suddenly made a huge new group of amazing friends in this incredible community because I entered the community and I put the time into repeatedly going to that community now it's the same for you guys if you have a hobby if you have an interest if you have something you love maybe it's you want to write. Maybe it's you want to make an app. Maybe it's you want to learn chess. Maybe it's you want to be the best salsa dancer ever. You know, go and do something you love. Go and do something that you really, really care about. And when you're exposed to communities who also love the same thing, when you're going regularly to the writing group or to the chess club or to the salsa class, you're going to see those same people again and again and again and again and again. And that's where the friendship comes out of through that repeated contact in something that you actually enjoy doing. And it's a secondary, it's a beautiful secondary achievement of something that was always about you and you taking care of you. So, so start with you and do something that you love and then see what comes of that and trust yourself that you know how to communicate if anything goes wrong in that friendship again and know that you have the strength to be able to say if something's not appropriate you, you will tell that person that it's not appropriate you need you need to trust yourself and practice 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 <laughs> Amazing. Well, that's all we have time for today. But if you're still looking for some more tips on how to manage your friendships, we will leave links to Hannah's website and socials, as well as our overcoming toxicity game plan in the description box below. Hannah, thank you so much for joining us today. Your knowledge and your tips have been incredible. Thank you so much for having me. And thanks so much for creating this incredible platform. Go and join the Smart Women Society on Instagram because it's just one of the most beautiful. I love your posts, guys. Every time I see them, I'm like, yes, I can take control of my finances. Yes, I can take control of my life. So thank you for all the content you guys put out. You're very welcome. Thank you for your kind words. We hope you enjoyed this video today. Comment down below what other topics you want us to cover. And don't forget to give this video a thumbs up and subscribe to our channel. Thank you for watching and we'll see you next time.